Good morning, New Life Church. We are so incredibly glad that you're here this morning. Thank you for being here. Please take a moment and help me welcome our church family who's joining us online. Let's give them a big round of applause. My name is Tim Mitchell, and this is my beautiful wife, Jamie. You've heard in this sermon series about friends and dating and marriage. And this morning, we're going to try to unpack a little bit about parenting. And don't think this doesn't apply to you if you're younger or if you're not married or if you're a kid um, or if, you don't, if you're married but don't have children yet. Because everyone in this place either has had parents or going to be a parent. You were a kid or are a kid. Or you might look after a kid someday. So hopefully you'll find something in this message to take home with you. Before we get started, will you pray with me? Father God, first and foremost, we lift up the people of Ukraine to you. It's times like this, I'm so thankful that you know our hearts because I have no words. As I watch this unfold, I just don't even know what to say. But we pray for their protection and we pray for their peace soon. Father, as we dive into a message about parenting, we recognize that you were the ultimate parent and you have pursued a relationship with us from the beginning. Lord, bless this room. Let the words that Tim and I speak only be of you and a message that someone needs to hear. Give us all the courage to mentally move away from our distractions and be fully engaged with you. Open the minds and the eyes and ears and the hearts in this room and help us to hear your message. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So when you start thinking about giving a message on parenting, and that had to come after dealing with the fear I have of standing right here in front of all of you, which is as terrifying as I expected, <laughs> um, your first instinct is to make a list of everything that you did wrong so we could give it to you and save you all from the same mistakes that we made. But then we thought that probably wasn't the message that Dan was looking for. <laughs> so once we dealt with that fear, not just of speaking, but of admitting all of our faults and mistakes in front of you, we came to a few truths about ourselves. We don't know everything there is to know about parenting. We have failed more times than we can count and we continue to fail while we develop different relationships with our adult children. We were parented by our parents, much like they were parented by their parents, probably much like they were parented by their parents. And we took those experiences and did the best that we could. Over the last month or so, we've heard lots of um, messages about unmasking. And I think that parenting offers you the perfect opportunities to mask up, whether it's putting on a mask so that others don't know that you're struggling, because I'm fine, we're fine. <laughs> or putting on that mask so that your children don't have to deal with your adult issues and disappointment. Or even putting on a mask so they don't know you as people, because aren't we supposed to be more than just ordinary people to our kids? Lots of opportunities to mask up. But being on this side of, or on the other side of everyday child rearing, we know that there's a better way, an unmasked way a way that we wish we had understood better when our kids were younger so that we could have applied it more, a biblical way. So Jamie and I decided to wait three years after we got married before we had our first kid, right? We were planning on taking care of our, our careers and just growing up a little bit. We just assumed, of course, that we could get pregnant anytime we wanted. So we waited three years, and then we realized God had very different plans for us. <laughs> After five years of trying and fertility treatments and all that other stuff, we got pregnant for the first time. And it was super exciting. And Jamie was like, I don't know if I want to see the ultrasound or not. I don't know if we're going to have a boy or a girl. And I had to know. I just had to know. Right? And so we get this grainy, fuzzy picture of this ultrasound. And I looked at it, and the doctor said, you're going to have a boy. And I thought, I'm going to have a linebacker. <laughs> And Jamie said, well, what if he wants to play the piano? I said, awesome, we'll have a piano playing linebacker. <laughs> and she said, well, what if he wants to dance ballet? I'm like, that'd be great, a piano playing ballet dancing linebacker. It'll be awesome, awesome, awesome. And then he was born, and it was very clear um, that from a very young age that he was not incredibly athletic. And quite frankly, he just wasn't interested in what he now calls sports ball. <laughs> and it's not because we didn't try. We signed him up for every kind of athletic thing you can imagine. You see, our son wasn't who I thought he was going to be. And that turned out, quite frankly, to be one of God's 
most incredible blessing to me as a father. Somewhere along the way in his early years, I got it through my thick skull that my son had been uniquely designed with a set of gifts and characteristics and traits designed by the God of this universe. And that's pretty cool. God's perfect, not my perfect. Psalm 139 says, You created my inmost being. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. And listen to this part. This is so cool. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Hear that again. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them ever came to be. And so as we thought about this little boy, we realized one of the most important jobs for me as a father and Jane as a mother was first to help him have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And second, to help him figure out how God had wired him and what his gifts were and what his talents were and then figure out how to use those in his life. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Start children off in the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. That phrase, on the way they should go, that's not the way we think they should go. It's on the way God has designed them to go with their own unique gifts and talents. They're ordained, as that previous passage said. That means they're set apart to do a thing. Right? That's so cool if you think about that for our kids. Each child is uniquely designed by God with gifts and talents that are, that are completely unique to them. Our Jacob ended up being a very talented writer with a heart to serve Jesus and his community. There is and only ever will be one Jacob Mitchell or one Caleb Mitchell. Right? There's only one in the history of this world with their unique talents and their path and their plan that God set before, in front of them. And I will tell you, each of your children is a one and only unique, uniquely made miracle with his own or her own purpose. That means our job as parents, help them discover what that purpose is. Help them find what that path is, where God has led them, has made them to grow into. And part of helping them discover that path is good communication. Because I said so is not communication. <laughs> James 1.19 says, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. My faith is so much stronger today than it was when our kids were little, and one of the things that God has really worked on in me is my short temper. But back then, it had a pretty quick trigger, and one of the fastest ways to trigger it was by lying. And do you know how often little kids lie? I'm not talking about those big lies. I'm talking about, yeah, I brushed my teeth. No, you can't smell my breath. Those things would drive me crazy. But our relationships with our children are so dependent on good communication. We communicate to give them expectations of their behavior based on our beliefs and morals. If we can't communicate that, we've set them up for failure. When it comes to discipline or consequences, we should use good communication to help them understand what their mistake was and why it required consequences. But in those heated moments, communication takes on its own personality. I used to joke, and I use these because it's not a joke, it's really true, um, that the only tool in my parenting toolbox is sarcasm. And while I'm very proud that both of my boys took on my ways of sarcasm, because it leads to some pretty funny moments, it probably wasn't the best way to help a four-year-old learn the way through life. Hey, Dad, this is so important for us. I started following Christ about the same time we got pregnant with our first son. And as our son was growing and changing, so was I. One of the things that Jake said to us recently, um, as we were actually talking about parenting and doing the sermon, was that he didn't think our family communicated very well up until he was about in middle school. And you know what? He was right. I was terrible at understanding my own emotions, let alone talking about them. And Jamie did her best, but our two little boys were looking for their daddy to tell them how a man communicates and how he shares his emotions and his feelings. And quite frankly, I don't, I don't know how. I was so bad at it. And I don't know how to change that. And so for so long, I let my own baggage and my own stuff get in the way of teaching my boys how to communicate in an authentic, caring, transparent way. 
I'm going to veer off script for a second because <laughs> that makes me think this was such a valuable conversation for us to talk to our kids about how we parented them. And it makes me wish that we had had this conversation so long ago. So I would challenge all of you to have that conversation with your kids. What do you like in the way that we parent? What don't you like in the way that we parent? And see how you can come up with a more biblical way in your own parenting style with their encouragement. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we need to be able to communicate with our kids so that we can lead them to a relationship with Jesus. It's the foundation of everything else. We can make them go to church or youth group at least until a certain age. We can model the behavior that we want from them. But if we can't talk to them about Jesus and communicate how he will change their lives, then trust me, we yoke them with trying to figure that out all on their own at an age where they don't really have a fully developed frontal lobe. <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> um, much like God wants us to come to him, to communicate with him, and have a relationship with him, that's what we're looking for from our kids, so that when they are in trouble or they're faced with a serious decision, they're comfortable coming to us. We have opened that door by being quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger, which brings up our next topic. Another part of valuable communication with your child is apologizing. I find it hard to apologize to anyone, <laughs> um, but especially that child that you just punished. One of the hardest times not to get caught up in that need to be right is when you're arguing with a four-year-old who has very strong opinions of their own, and at some point during the argument, you realize that they might be right, that the points that they're making are completely valid, and you're thinking, but I already blew up. I already set the consequences. I can't back down now. Most of you know our son, Caleb. He plays in the worship band. Crazy hair. Um, <laughs> this was my biggest struggle with him. He would make me so angry, and I would blow up and start dishing out punishments, and then I would start listening, and his reasons were really valid, and they were just stymieing me because I didn't know what to do. So typically, I would just stick with my punishment and move on, hence the poor communication in our home. Um, but like Tim said, in separate conversations with our boys, when we were trying to develop this message, circling back and explaining the consequences or even apologizing are skills that they wish I had been better at. 1 Peter 4.8 says that most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. As I look for scripture about apologizing, this one just kept coming to me. And while it doesn't contain the word apologize, I think it's exactly what an apology is. Showing your deep love, such that you were willing to admit you were wrong, or that you overreacted, or that you hurt someone's feelings. If we listen and react from love, and are willing to admit our faults in love, it can truly change our relationships, not just with our children, but with all the people in our lives. There is great value in making sure that it's known that the relationship is more important than the need to be right. And I think this is a life skill that is woefully missing in our society today, and we can be that change by modeling this behavior to our children. When you go to the doctor, one of the first things that they ask you is about the health and the, uh, the health issues of your parents and your grandparents. Why do they do this? Well, we all know, right? Because many of our physical ailments are inherited. We get them from our ancestors who passed them down along our family tree, right? Unfortunately, the same thing applies to our mental, emotional, and, and spiritual health. The Bible actually talks about this. In fact, there are four places in the Old Testament where these nearly identical words are said. And this is God punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So this is God speaking. He says, I punish the children and their children for the sin or the iniquity of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. Here's a little Bible reading tip for you. Anytime the Bible talks about the same thing more than two or three times, you really should pay attention. <laughs> right? Now, let me unpack this for you just a little bit. There are three Hebrew words that are normally translated as sin. And in those four passages in the Old Testament, the same Hebrew word is used, and that word is avon. And avon means, um, it's translated sometimes into the English word iniquity, which is why sometimes you see the word iniquity in some of the translations. Um, but it means to twist or to bend. So sometimes in Hebrew, you'll, you'll hear people talking about a road being avon, right? Twisty and curvy and all that sort of stuff. It also means to distort um, or to, to be a perversion or to have crooked behavior. 
okay? So if you've never read these passages before, um, or, or if you even have, you might be like me, and you might be thinking, how does that make sense? We have a just and a good God. How can he blame children for the sins of their parents? It just doesn't make sense. I mean, he loves us. He sent his son to die for us. That's how much he loves us. So how do you, how do you make sense of all that? It just, for me, I don't know about you, but it didn't seem to fit when I first understood it. Um, so let me give you some context. I am the son of an alcoholic who is the son of an alcoholic who is the son of an alcoholic. My great-grandfather, by all accounts, was an incredibly mean drunk. My grandfather, his son, was beaten and abused from the time he was a young boy. As you all probably know, children who are physically and emotionally abused tend to have low self-esteem. They have a lack of self-confidence, overwhelming anxiety, oftentimes depression. And they themselves tend to be, whoop, hello. <laughs> they tend to have um, drug and alcohol abuse. And the sins of the father were passed down to the children to another generation. So when my grandfather grew up, he became a mean drunk. And he beat my grandmother and my father and his seven brothers and sisters on a regular basis. And the sins of the father were transferred down to another generation. So my dad, like his father before him, grew up thinking that he was not good enough. He felt worthless. He was insecure, inadequate, chronically depressed. And he didn't feel worthy to be loved by anybody. So for me, the good news was that my dad was not a mean drunk. He was a pretty social drunk. What sometimes in our society is called a functioning alcoholic. But still, the sins of the father were passed down to another generation. By God's grace, I don't have an alcoholic addictive personality. I got plenty of other stuff, plenty of other baggage that came with that stuff, though, um, that, I, that I get to deal with. And by God's grace, my mom said, I'm not going to live with an alcoholic, so they divorced when I was three years old. Right? So I was separated a little bit from that. That's what the scriptures mean by passing the iniquities of the parents down to their children and to the next generation and the next generation. My family story is alcoholism and all the garbage that comes with it. Yours might be too. Or it could be some other childhood issue like trauma or sexual abuse or emotional abuse, anxiety, um, feeling unloved, insecurity. The list goes on and on and on, right? Your family might be multi, or your, your family history might be multi generational like mine is. Or it might have just started with you. But I'm also here to tell you that it can end with you in either situation. God says, I heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds, right? He says, Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and I will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. See, because of God's grace, his love and his mercy, we have a way out, right? We don't have to live with those crushing burdens that rob us of joy as being people or as being parents. Romans 8 says, therefore, there is no, now no condemnation, condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free. Right? That means we don't have to carry that stuff. It is for freedom that God has set us free, that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by that yoke of slavery. We don't have to carry that burden every single day. We've been set free from that. That's a time to praise Jesus. I mean, <laughs> we are all set free. So parenting, while super rewarding, can also be hard, and everyone has advice for you. Tim told me a funny story that um, Mark Twain once said, when a boy turns 13, feel him in a barrel and feed him through the knot hole. When he turns 16, feel up the hole. <laughs> I think some of us probably wanted to do that with our teenagers. Um, while it's really cool to see your children finding their path, 
developing their independence and becoming who God wants them to be, not the ballet dancing, piano playing linebacker that you wanted, <laughs> but God's path for them. It can also be hard. You might not naturally collect with, connect with their interests, and because of that, you might not be able to help them with hurdles that they'll face along the way. We're telling lots of stories about our older son, Jacob. We can also tell you lots of stories about Caleb if you want to meet later. Um, but doesn't that first child tend to be the guinea pig? And so you have more stories about them anyway. He was always a voracious reader. And one of my favorite memories is he would sneak a book to the dinner table and hide it under his lap and try to read while he was eating and us not catch him. And honestly, I loved it. What a beautiful hobby to have, to love books so much that you'll sneak it into the dining table or onto the dining table. And he is so smart, and I know it's from all the information that he absorbed because he had that hobby. But on the other side of parenting, I wonder if letting him escape into a book prevented me from having that deeper communication with him during his formative years. Did I connect with him on the, the level that he needed me to? And honestly, I think that answer is no. We've asked him for permission to share stories, just so you know. Um, when he was in middle school, he started showing lots of signs of anger. By the time we moved to Kalamazoo, he was in sixth grade, and we had lived in seven different homes. And they, some of them were because of Tim's jobs and other reasons, and they all took different baggage to each of those homes. And that's a lot for a young person to move that much and to have to make new friends every time. We had also recently lost Tim's mom, who Jacob was very close to. And so he had a lot of emotion, and our parenting efforts were not successful in redirecting him. We didn't know what to do. And this sweet, friendly, kind person that we had always known was withdrawing more and more. So we took him to counseling. Proverbs 13.10 says, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. For me, one of the hardest parenting realizations was that I couldn't help my child. It was not our job. At that time, it was my only job. <laughs> Wasn't I supposed to be able to know what he needed and to fix it for him? Your pride can take a hit, and that hurts. But if you can step away from that and accept that you're not the one, you can really help your child by making sure they're getting what they need and not just what you think they need. Whether it's professional counseling or connecting them with a youth group where other Christian adults can pour into them, or choosing not to be their coach because that's a relationship that they struggle with with you, finding the right thing for your child can help them figure out how to take that advice in a more positive forum. We have lots of single parents in our community, and this church is a place where you can find support. If you are a single mom with a son that you feel like needs a good um, Christian role model, we have those here for you. Likewise, if you're a single dad who has a girl that you need a Christian woman to pour into, Find a worship host or someone in the lobby and let us connect you with somebody who can help you with that. The church should be a place that we can all unmask and ask for help and get the support that we need. Especially in today's world, we are also worried, and it's rightfully so, about outside influences on our kids. But this is also a time where we can be teaching them how to find those positive relationships before they're at an age where we're not by their side when they have to make that decision. So Jamie and I have a saying that we've used since our kids were very, very small. That saying is, love them through it. And now, of course, we use that mostly when they've done something and we wanted to throw them out a window. But, we never wanted to throw them out a window. No. <laughs> but also sometimes when they were just struggling, right? They were just uh, trying on a new personality or they were, you know, uh, struggling with something themselves and they weren't being the best version of them, right? And... That whole notion of love them through it comes from 1 Corinthians. And you've all probably heard this in the context of marriage. And I actually think that this verse, or the series of, of verses, it works even better for parenting. Listen to these words with the notion of being a parent to a child. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. For us, that idea of loving them through it meant that we had to find that never-ending reserve of patience. <laughs> Didn't always work. <laughs> We had to forgive them quickly. We had to speak truth and sometimes very hard things to them um, with kindness and deep, deep love. We had to keep our anger in check. And every parent in this room knows how hard that is sometimes. Right? And we had to let them know that we were always on their side, even when they screwed up. And to be fair with them, even when we had to punish them. So 
hug them a hundred times a day and to tell them we love them a hundred times a day. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Amen. One last point and then we'll wrap up this message. While the primary reason for all of our thoughts on parenting is to lead our children to a relationship with Jesus, I'm stuck. <laughs> they can also be used to help them battle that spiritual warfare that they have gone through, are going through, or will go through. They are God's children, so it's inevitable. The devil wants to derail them. And the devil knows that the fastest way to derail you is by attacking your child. Amen. Mama bears get all fired up and lose their minds at activities. Dads get overprotective and try to forge their path instead of helping them accept the situation as it is. We've all witnessed that or been that. And that separates husbands from wives. It separates children from parents. Our society doesn't believe that you should apologize when you're wrong. Our society says lie to get what you want. Our society doesn't say fathers communicate and be open with your children. If you watch a television show, most of the time the dad is a joke, certainly not a spiritual leader. Our society tells us to make idols of our kids and live vicariously through them to find our happiness. But the beauty is we don't have to listen to society. We know that God is always with us in our celebrations and in our strife. We have a book, the book, to teach us how to teach them. And we have an open line of communication to God through prayer. We taught our boys different household chores, and that I would just continue to do them. <laughs> In fact, I'll still do Caleb's laundry or pick up his space without him expecting it or asking it. Heck, if Morgan and Jacob want to bring over their laundry, I'll do theirs too. <laughs> because in that time of doing their laundry or making their bed, that's when I would pray over them. I would give them over to God. I would ask him to intercede with them and to draw them close. As I touched their tangible parts of their lives, I could give them over to God. Prayer is our greatest weapon against the attacks on our children. Society is okay with our children being exposed to all the sins of the world. And we can't always stop that because we can't always be there. But we can communicate and we can love. We can be just a little bit better than our parents before us. And we can pray for their safety, their self-esteem, their influences, and their choices. Back to that list I referred to at the beginning. It's finally taken us, or it's taken us a while, but we finally can admit that our children are who they are because of us, and also in spite of us. Amen. We feel like we've, get, we've given them two very equally important lessons. One, to, different types of parenting to model, and the second, things not to do when you're a parent. And we look forward to them taking that and raising their kids to be um, great children of God in his kingdom, just a little better than we did it. When I look out into this congregation today, I see so many friends and so many great parents. But maybe some of you have some challenges like we did. And the good news is that no matter how good of a parent you are today, every day you get to choose to be just a little bit better, whether your child is 2 or 32, because every day is new in Christ. Amen. Please bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray with me. Father God, thank you this morning for this message and for filling this place with uh, your Holy Spirit. We pray, dear God, that um, you might be touching hearts and minds this morning. We ask you, Father, to, um, to continue to live in our lives. Lord, for those who don't know you, we ask, Father, that um, you will stir something inside of them um, to want to know you. Everyone in this auditorium is likely carrying a load of burdens. Some came from our parents, and some came from our siblings, and some, some, from, some came from our schoolmates. Some came from complete strangers. Some from our circumstances that were not of our making, and some just because of our own actions or behavior. Life could be super tough in the best of homes and in the best of lives. Jesus tells us we don't have to carry those burdens alone. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus, talking about salvation, said, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. God wants a personal relationship with us, with everyone in this place, with everyone in this planet. He's not interested in you, in, in you following a bunch of rules or being religious or spiritual or any of that stuff. He's looking for a day-to-day, moment-by-moment relationship with each of us. 
Romans 3.23 says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The falling sh- that falling short or missing the mark, that's what we call sin. And that sin separates us from God. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of, of that sin is death. And there is no way we, in our own power, can bridge that gap of separation. But God. Because God loved you and me so much, he sent his one and only son who willingly sacrificed himself and died on a Roman cross to take our sins upon himself so that we could be clean and made right in God's eyes. Then Jesus was raised three days later to defeat death and go into heaven and be our advocate forever. John 3.16, you've all heard it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He isn't looking for you to clean up your act or get right before you answer his call. If he's tugging at your heart right now, I encourage you to let him in. Listen to that call. We don't ask you to come down and give a testimony or, or anything like that. While every eye is closed and every head is bowed, if God is knocking on your heart right now, let him in. If God is, if God is tugging on you right now, I'd like you to lift your hand without anybody looking around. I'd like you to raise your hand now. I see you. Thank you. You can put your hands down now, please. If you raise your hand or if you wanted to but maybe were afraid to or, or just didn't feel comfortable doing that, I'd like to help you in a prayer to ask Jesus into your life. Please pray with me. Dear God, I hear you knocking on my heart and I want you to be in my life. I want a relationship with you. I, I confess that I am a sinner and my sin has separated me from you. I know you sent Jesus to die in my place for the forgiveness of my sins and I know that he died and was raised three days later. Forgive me, God, and come live in my heart and walk with me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, church, the Bible says that if one sinner has come to Christ, all of heaven rejoices. So please join me in rejoicing for those this morning.